Hey, yo, check it out. It's the one and only, never phony. Your big homie treat me like Tony. PD Crack, live in effect with Mikey T, the movie star. Let's go, baby. Ring. Oh, man, Mikey T, the movie star. Hey, what's up with the movie star thing, man? Tell me what that's about. All right, so basically my brother, my brother Jeremiah Kipp is a director. He, uh, he came up out of Rhode Island. I've always lived on the border of Connecticut and Rhode Island, right? So mm-hmm. he, went to, he went to NYU, which is like one of the best schools in America. So he basically he has been making movies for his whole life. He started off getting the kids around the neighborhood to put on uh, face paint, and he made some zombie movies and shit. You know what right. I mean? He really started. So he actually has a new horror movie coming out called Slap Face, but my brother's always been the director, right? Uh, he worked for New Line Cinema. He freelances his own movies now. He put me in movies since I was like four or five years old, you know? So okay. my brother's the director. I'm the movie star. Hey, check it out. I didn't think that you was going to give me that, uh, the real uh, meaning of it. I thought it meant like something that was like, it's, you say the movie star and then it means something totally different. Well, you, know you really it mean it means that you were really in the movies. Right, right, literally. Right. But, but I'm just talking about home movies as well. But but my brother do be putting me in his new big movies and shit. But also right. with the moniker, you know what I mean? Like 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 Fifty Cent, like Ja Rule. You know what I mean? It's a moniker. You know, Mikey T, the movie star. No doubt, I like it, man. I like it. Uh, when we uh, we ready, you ready to get started now, or we already started? Yeah, sort of like yeah, we're started right now. But sort of like how you were talking about. Petey Crack from Carlito's Way, which really made me want to go check that movie out. Yeah, yeah, man. That, that's where my name come from, man. Uh, it's this thing with Fat Joe, man. No disrespect to Fat Joe. Joey Crack, the dime. But he feels as though I stole his name. But I didn't. I, I got that from the movie Carlito's Way. It was a guy named Benny Blanco from the Bronx. And my, back at that time, my name was Pedro Tequila. So I just freely said it in a verse, like they used to call me PD Cracko, like Benny Blanco, just thinking nothing of it. And then that particular song became like a little neighborhood banger, and everybody just kept saying PD Cracko. Right. So my name, my name was Cracko for a long time, and then you know niggas would just break it down like, hey yo, crack. So it turned into PD Crack, and I just dropped the uh, Pedro to Killer, just coincidentally his. He went from Fat Joe to Joey Crack, and he not feeling me uh, running with the name. But I ain't going nowhere, man. And I got love and respect for him. He's one of the inspirations from when I was a kid uh, watching uh, him digging in the crates crew, Lord Finesse, Facts. and all of them. So I really, you know what I'm saying, I take my hat off to him, but sorry you feel that way about you, man. PD, it was a different time back then. You know what I mean? It was a different era. Fat Joe was still at the point in his career where he wanted to make all the history that he wound up making from being a mainstay on MTV. And then for PD Crack to show up on the scene, it's like, oh, shit, this guy with a similar name to me who quite possibly is going to be famous as hell, you know what I mean, has a similar name. But for real, it, it, we knew Fat Joe as Fat Joe. It wasn't like a, a, a Rick Ross, Ricky Rose thing. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. We didn't know him as yeah. Joey Crack really like that, like where he was going to sell his album as Joey Crack. Yeah, man. Hey, but I like what he's doing right now, man, to be I honest with you, man. I love what he's doing, man. It's really entertaining. I just watched him uh, getting Ebro ass. That, that was very uh, fulfilling. No, he's always doing something dope. Did the two of you ever get a chance to connect, man? Nah, we never met. He said in an interview that he ran down on me and he met me, but I've never met him in person. So, no, I've never met him and physically. I've seen him like how you've seen You ever met him? Uh, I actually ran into Fat Joe at one point. You know, I went through a bunch of BS issues at one point with Tony Sunshine. So when I moved to Florida, Miami, you know Fat Joe is a main – presence in miami right yeah hell yeah so when i seen him at club uh it might have been mansion I, when i seen him at mansion i had to go and walk up to him and tell him yo i'm mikey t the movie star my bad about all that shit 
I'm glad I'm actually getting a chance to say this on camera now. All right, yeah. Sometimes you can speak this shit into existence, though. You know, Petey, I think... Hey, well, I think let me say this. I, I would love to meet him, honestly. I, I really, I've always looked forward to meeting him. And I believe that day will come that we meet, and um, and I think he'll fuck with me, because I fuck with him, you know what I mean? He's a, he's a big homie. It would be a pleasure. But on his end, I don't know how he feel about me. But I think he'll fuck with me once he meets me. You yeah. know what I mean? But yo, man, I appreciate you coming in to speak with me for no an doubt. interview, man. I want to let's get let's get into it. Yeah, man, I want to take it back to the beginning. You know, I've interviewed a lot of Philly artists. You know, this is our first joint. How was it actually growing up in Philly, North Philly, right? Yeah, yeah, North Side, man. Um, it was definitely an experience, man. Uh, I'm an only child, so. Uh, I don't know, man. It, it was it was it was a different experience, you know what I'm saying? A worthwhile experience, though. I definitely appreciate it, but uh, it was a rough ride, man. Definitely a rough ride. Lost a lot of homies and just seen a lot of stuff that all of us did. All me and uh, everybody that from my at, at my age that came up with me, we seen a lot of stuff, man. You know what I mean? And to still, I'll be real appreciative now to be at this age and to still be able to be functional mentally and physically, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and still have opportunity and to be who I am is like a super blessing. I'll be having to remind myself to be thankful because when I look around, my around a lot of homies is gone. A lot of people who had the same dream as me didn't even get a chance to make it. And in jail or whatever, or just life just took a different, a bad turn. And I'm just blessed, you know what I mean? But uh, Philly is Philly, man. And I'm not here to say like it's something is worse than anywhere else. It's worse all, it's bad all over. But just that particular experience I went through in Philly is definitely, definitely something that uh, could go in a movie, you know what I'm saying? So being a more cultured artist now, seeing the world, can you tell me what it was like building your name in Philly compared to like the advantages you could see that others would have elsewhere, like New York, Miami, Los Angeles? Um, Philly rough. Building a name musically, you mean? Like in the right. industry? Yeah. Tough. Tough. Real tough, man. Because Philly... Um, I ain't gonna say we 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 uh, there's a lot of haters here or we just hate on each other, but it's really hard to get a large amount of people to all fuck with you when you ain't nobody yet. You know what I'm saying? If you get a following here, once you get a following here, man, if they love you, man, that, they say if you can make it in Philly, you can make it anywhere. And um, I think because because of them being so hard, that's why we rap so good. That's why we had so many great rappers. We got a lot of good rappers, and everybody credit us on how we got some spitters here in Philly. I think I don't think it's nothing in the water. I think it's because it's so much pressure, and the bar is so high that you got to rap good. You got to step your game up here. It ain't no lazy playing around shit. And all the goofy shit, you're going to get booed. Niggas going to try to roll on you from the era I'm from. Niggas try to roll on you. You can't come around with that dumb shit. So, uh if you made, I made it here in Philly, man, that that gave me the, um, you know, you work your confidence up, and I just felt mad confident once I once I made it home. I mean, once I started, once I started feeling myself here in Philly, uh, I kind of you kind of know that you on the right track, you know what I mean? So I want to ask you, man, what was the first chance that you got to see that you could actually get into the music industry and make it out? Uh, when I saw Freeway. Um, when I saw free, when I heard Freeway on One Nine Hundred Hustler rapping with uh with Jay Z and um Beanie Siegel and Memphis, once I saw him there, cause this is my same homie that uh I knew since I was like eight nine years old, and we didn't been through uh, going since going to Halloween costume parties as little kids, playing in old houses and shit to growing up uh, selling crack uh, and taking shifts in the crack house together. We went to set through all throughout high school, rap group shit, the whole process. So when we got to the age of like um like roughly 21, 22, Free got signed to Rockefeller. And once I seen him do that, I knew that I could do it. Cause I've never known nobody that 
I never met somebody who made it. Personally knew them. He was the first person I knew personally that I know I say this my man that really made it. Like he's like right there on the TV. You know what I'm saying? So that, that I was like, yo, I know I could do it. That's my man. He did it. And he's right next to me a couple minutes ago. So I'm about to go do this shit too. You know what I mean? Can you tell me about how Freeway helped you in your situation with Jay-Z? Is that how it went? Could you explain it to me? Uh, uh, that's not exactly how it went. That's not exactly how it went. But I'm going to tell you, look, because this is funny you said that because uh, I just heard Free say something in reference to this in an interview recently. And I, me and Free like this. We were just in the studio the other day. We always talk. I just got off the phone with him like five minutes ago. It's my brother. Free. But we know that we're going to be real and we're going to be honest with each other. You know, everybody, it's three sides to every story. You know what I'm saying? Facts. Everybody got their way of seeing the way it went. So this is my way that it went. But he did correct me uh, on something that I left out, which is very true. Because in interviews in the past, I would always say that I told him that I grew up with Free, but he didn't bring me up Rockefeller. Um, uh, I got. I feel like I feel more so that Oskino and Sparks gave me more push to meet Dame and and uh, more support on helping me get signed. Uh, but the truth is more so is that way before anybody got signed to Rockefeller back in the day, uh, our manager that we, me and Freeway was in a group, we had a manager and we was in a group called Ice City and they took us up to New York, right? Freeway didn't bring me up there. Somebody took us up there cause we were a group together and we all rapped for uh, Jay and Dane in front of Jay and Dane. Freeway did awesome, killed it, as he always does. He real good in front of crowds, and I used to get real nervous back then. So when I spit, I froze up, and I started fucking up and fumbling and stumbling, and it was horrible. Like, that was the night I was ready to just throw the towel on, like, yo, I ain't doing this shit. Anyway, I did I did horribly, and uh, that's the first time I met Damon Big and Jay and them. But when I re-met them again, they don't remember that they been met me a long time ago. They didn't know that I was a little, uh, little, little Puerto Rican kid that that bombed that night. They don't remember that. And then Dane was just like, he was like, "Yo, you Petey Crack? Nice to meet you, man. Oh shit, I love your verse and this and that." And I'm looking at him. Oh, I wasn't thinking about this. I thought about it later. Like, yo, I met you already. You just don't know it. I, I did. I did it horribly. But anyway. Shout out to Freeway. We did go up to you. I stand corrected. We did go up there together and, and met Jay. And then I re met them through Owen Sparks and everybody else. And Beans was involved. For the record, Free. And if you if you want to go in the next interview and counter that, be my guest. Um, so let me ask you, going into that a little bit, you credit Emilio Sparks and Oskino. Um, does, yeah. that have, does that have anything to do with the fact that you are uh, not on the first album, but you're on the second album? Were you brought in initially with State Property, or were you brought in at the second album? Could you explain that? I was brought in at the second album. All right, so uh, the first album, I was home with everybody else, uh, watching State Property, the movie. And this is weird to say. That's weird. But I was. I was listening to the Funk Master Flex uh, freestyle, Hot 9-7, and I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm an artist, but I'm just an inspiring artist at the time. And I'm watching them. I'm loving what I'm seeing. I love the movie. This is coming out of Philly. Benny Siegel is the biggest thing in Philly. Freeway is next up. He's killing it. They got the old skin on Sparse, Chris and Neve, State Property, the group. I'm tuned in. Just so happens, I wouldn't say by chance, as faith may have it, uh, I run into... Uh, Oskino at Community College. Uh, somebody had an event at a community community college. Uh, he's popping. He's running around Jaguars, the rock chain all on. I see him. I'm like, yo, hey, yo, what's up, fam? Um, he heard me rap before. I'm like, yo, it's me, Petey. You know what I'm saying? He's like, yo, I liked you, man. Yo, I heard you rap before. Give me your number. I want to do a song with you. Right? I gave him my number. He hits me a couple days. It was fast. We shoot to the studio and we start a song uh, called How Many Niggas Gonna Ride For Me. Now, on that particular song, it was a kid named Young Grant who passed away, God rest his soul. Young Grant was on the song, and uh, uh, he passed like, uh, like 
a week later after I did the song. So uh uh O was like, yo, crack, I want to take this song up to Damon them, but uh we gotta get somebody else on it. I'm sorry, it's sorry, it's a sad thing that the kid passed away. We gotta uh put somebody else on this song so we could push the song. So he went and got Sparks. He called Sparks, so we put a Sparks on the on the song. So now we got the song. How many niggas gonna rob for me? I'm still home in Philly, uh doing whatever I'm doing. They're in Miami and LA and moving around with Rockefeller Records. But I've been staying in contact throughout the process. I talk to Sparks. More so I've talked to Sparks a lot more on the phone. And Sparks, one day I talked to him and he said, Yo, we in Miami, crack. Uh we out here working on the a new album, uh, working on the, no, it wasn't the second album. We working on, they was working on the first album, finishing that up. And if you can get a flight out here, you just come out and we're going to introduce you to Dane. And that's what I did. I got a flight out there, flew out there that night and, um, met Dane that night and he signed me that night right there on the spot. I was, I, I was in time for the second album. And once I got there and once I got in position, uh, I just started doing what I had to do, man. I just started recording. And uh, once I seen that Dame, once, I didn't know what to do at first, but once I seen what I was, what I had to offer was being accepted, like I would go there and record and I started to see what they liked about me. And Dame and Biggs would be like, yo, yo, that's the type of shit you gotta do, crack. That kind of song, yo, bring that shit back, play that again. Crack, do more shit like this. So I just started tuning in with my, you know, with the shit that got more character and personality and all that ring and all that. I started going into it. And that's when it started to make like this uh, snowball effect. And that's when I started kicking them songs out. Like, uh, right. got, got to have it. And you know what I mean? All the, all the hit joints that we did. I got to jump ahead a little bit since we're talking about the Second State Property album. Uh, when you hear that with Beanie Siegel, yourself, and Old Dirty Bastard, man, can we talk about that record? Okay, so check it out. Um, for for years throughout the throughout the time that I was signed, um, up up until the time we did that record, Beans always knew that I'm a big Old Dirty Bastard fanatic. Like, like my he like my top three artists in the world ever to this day. You know what I'm saying? Influence wise, like I'm majorly but influenced by Old Dirty Bastard. So Beans uh, ended up in the studio with Dirty one night because, you know, remember uh, Dirty got signed to Rockefeller. Right. So he would be in our sessions and, you know, just randomly now, old Dirty is a part of the family. I'm in Philly there in Manhattan in the studio. So Matt called me one late night like, yo, Crack, where are you? What are you doing? He said, yo, I'm in the studio with your man right now. I'm like, who? He's like, yo, your man, I'm in, I got old Dirty right here. We about to kill some shit. I'm like, oh, shit. He's like, yo, come up here right now. I got a slot for you on this track. So I'm, I'm scrambling around trying to get up to New York. You know, I got that's like a two-hour drive. So by the time I got up there, uh, they both laid their verses. Dirty left the studio, and uh, it was just me and Mac. And Mac played the verses for me, and uh, I wrote my verse right there on the spot and just laid it. Sad to say I didn't get to do it with Old Dirty. I'm still appreciative that I got a track with him, but I can't say that I actually did it with him. Like, we didn't vibe in the stew with it, and I'm definitely sorry about that, but definitely got a track in with Dirt for the record. So that's how that went. But later, I did end up meeting him and talking to him, but we never politic no uh, music shit. I was just talking to him about some regular shit. That's when he was a part of Rockefeller? Yeah, exactly. What was it like when he joined the Rockefeller? Was that like something you would have ever expected? It took a lot of people by storm. Yeah, I was excited. I was excited at the idea of it. But then when I sat in and talked to him and I got to see where he was at mentally, I was. Uh, um, it was kind of sad because he wasn't the same no more. You know what I'm saying? And I know Dirty from really studying the music and – just watching uh, footage and all of that, it just wasn't the old, old dirty that I grew up on. But, you know, I think he had issues in prison with the medication or some shit. I'm not exactly sure, but I still got, he's still legendary to me. And I gave him nothing but love and respect, but uh, it wasn't 
the same old dirty though. Like it just seemed like he wasn't there. You know what I'm saying? I hear you, man. Um, they actually did a music video for that record. I was checking the video out, hoping to see your part on it, but they actually compi- combined two uh, uh, videos for that joint. Do you remember anything about that shoot? I'm, I can't even really tell you, man. It was, it was no verse. They had me, I had to stand on the car and bust the windows out and some shit, right? I didn't see that video in a minute, but I remember that because I, I cut my hand. Um, was it like a two-day shoot, or were you actually on the set with everybody that was involved, like Dirty and Oskino and Emilio? Uh, yeah, we were all together. We were all, I think it was one full day we shot all of that stuff. Yep, one full day. And, uh, yeah, it was just a weird time, man. It was very unorganized, man. But it was getting, it was just, he was getting shit done, but I think it could have been done a little better. But I do appreciate getting the job done because that was around the time, uh, you know, who else was getting video shot right back then? I was right. on like my third or fourth video. I just got there. Because this is something, man, you know, I would be ashamed of myself if I didn't mention the groundbreaking record, Stay. Can you tell me about the collab with Neo, man? I'd be ashamed of myself if I didn't talk to you about this. Just playing it earlier today that record mm-hmm. impacted so many people in the country and in, in the world yeah man that was an interesting um situation man that's why i'm really thankful a lot of things happened most of the things that happened were, that was like great things like that like that record being put together just happened it wasn't like a big effort or a, a well thought out plan to try to come up with something great it was just a natural organic situation that just fell into place and that's how most good things happen well in my situation whenever I really sat down and tried to focus on doing something big or trying to like really make a hit record that never works that way any record I had that was like big like flip side or the neo stay it just fell into place so um I was in New York having a meeting with Jay and uh I bumped into Tata and this is, I, I wasn't aware of this, but Ty Ty is the, um, I think the, the A&R, or the, I believe he was the A&R of Neo's album on the first album. That's when they first signed Neo right. to Def Jam, because Jay was album. the, Def, Jay was the president of Def Jam at the time. So uh, Ty Ty was like, yo, crack, I got an artist, uh, some new artist. He's a crazy songwriter, but he's about to put out an album. Uh, I need a verse from you. So this was around the CD times where did somebody burn you a, a CD on a blank and you take the CD home and go right to it. So I said, cool, let me get the CD and I'll go home and I'll come back up and record it. He said, nah, I need it right now. Like I need it like right, right, right now. So I said, all right, fuck it. I was with my manager and uh, at the time and um, it was mad snow outside. It was, we in the middle of Manhattan. It's like winter snow, like crazy cold winter time out there we we grabbed our coats and just left the cars parked and walked from the universal building over to Times square where it was a studio and he had it all set up already guru was in there engineering and me just me Ty, Ty, my manager and guru and uh he played one record from neo that was cool to me i don't know if i heard that record ever again or maybe i did but then he, he played uh, the Stay record. And once he threw that on, I knew that was the one because uh, it had the sample from El DeBarge, which is one of my favorite R&B groups of all time. And it just had that hip hop feel to it. It had the scratching and the cuts in it. And the drum, the beat was crazy. It was still like a hip hop beat. And the artist that came on was dope. And I wrote it right there on the spot. I wrote it there. And uh, laid it, and Ty heard it, he liked it, and I left the studio and just ain't think nothing of it. Because around that time, I'm able to do any type of record. Like, I'm a chameleon, you know what I'm saying? I can adapt to any kind of vibe. But my preference, especially around that time, was like some real gritty, grimy, hood rap. Like, you know what I mean? Gangster shit. So I did that record and just forgot about it because it wasn't like I was riding around listening to the shit. And like a, a week, couple weeks to a month later, they called me. I was in Miami 
uh, Tata called me with, with Jay on the line and said, like, yo, the um, that song is number one on, on the radio right now in, in New York. And uh, uh, we about to shoot the video, so you got to get ready. And that was how that, that's how that went. Right, so this is after basically Rockefeller split, Jay-Z and Dame Dash, Rockefeller. Uh, this, this, was, this, was, group. this was after the split. That's what made it iller to me, too, because, uh, you know, we had a lot of success before the split. Everybody had their own little form of success and it felt like, um, pretty much like we achieved something. Like, you know, Chris and Neve had the No Better Love and Can't Stop, Won't Stop. And uh, um, Beans, you know him, he had all the uh, numerous hits and uh, about, he had about three, four albums and he had everything going on, movies and he shit. could have went anywhere. Right. Um, I had a, I was on flip side and I had the, when, the, when you hear that and I was just bubbling in the streets. So when they split, it was kind of, uh, everybody's shit situation was just up in limbo and wasn't sure where he was going to go with it. And I was even a little nervous about what direction I was going in. So for that to happen, like uh, that was the biggest record I've ever done happened after the split. So that really was um that was an ill feeling too. Like it let me know that I still had it. Like I'm like yo, I can still do it. Like even after the split, I got another hit record on my hands. So yeah. No, that's dope, man. Because like like you were saying, you could see like Beanie Siegel could have went anywhere. Yeah. Young Guns already had their shit together with their albums. You came out with this single. So was there a, a situation that was proposed to you with Def Jam and the Prince of the Rock album? Can we talk about that? Um, yeah, all right. So uh, when the split happened, uh, in, in the contracts, I believe it was in all our contracts, because we all, I had a Def Jam Rockefeller contract I was signed to. So in the contract, it stated that if the parties, the owners, the CEOs or whatever, if they were to break up and sell this company, that you can't sell the artist with the company. So when they sold Rockefeller or whatever they did when they split up, uh, it was a voided contract and everybody was free. Well, I know I was free to go my way. So uh, right when that happened, I had a meeting with Dane. And at first, I think he assumed that I was going to stay with him, just to stay with him. And I'm very appreciative of working with him, but at the time, I felt things could, more could be could have been done for me. So I was willing to leave unless he told me that he was willing to do more. And when I had a meeting with him and he told me what he was able to do, it just wasn't enough for me. So uh, I just left. And... Honestly, right after that, I was just really thinking I was looking for another label. Other labels was hollering at me, but I was just trying to just wait and see who was uh, waiting for my lawyer to give me the green light. Like, yo, you should go with this. But uh, just so happens we bumped into Jay again. And Jay was like, yo, uh, PD don't got to go nowhere. He can stay here with me. He want to stay at Def Jam? Tell him to come back over here. We'll finish his album at Def Jam. And that's what happened. I went, had a meeting with him one night. He's like, yo, stay here, finish the album, man. Finish what you started. And that's when we, I was back on the Def Jam uh, train and did the Neo joint. That's how that happened. That's what's up, man. I really think Jay actually saw your worth. You know what I mean? You didn't, you didn't really choose any sides, but you came back and showed that you were going to be a presence in music, man. So I got to ask you, though, when you're, doing the record for Neo. So you weren't technically in the studio with Neo. You know, it was nah, the CD. The CD. I, I didn't even know what he looked like. Um, did, did they film your music video separate as well? Because you did. Nah, we, we, we shot that together. Okay. Yeah, I met him at the video shoot. We I met at the shoot. Like, I flew to uh, LA one morning and I, I get to the, to the the location and they had trailers and shit all around. So... Big budget shit. Def Jam. Yeah, it was some big budget shit for sure. And uh, I go on his trailer and he's in there like practicing dance moves and shit. 
And I'm like, yo, what's up? I'm Petey, man. I'm on the record. And he, I, I was, he was cool, dude, though. He was real cool. So basically what I kind of wanted to ask you uh, was like, you know, was there ever an opportunity for you to say, you know, I did this record for you. Can we get one in response? Or would that kind of have been out of pocket with all the business? Uh, honestly, man, the opportunity was there. I feel it was because, you know, after the record had came out, we did mad shows together. Like I went on tour with him and we would meet up in different cities. Like they were like, yo, Neil's performing here tonight. If you could make it down here. We love if you come in this and that. So we always would be in cahoots and see each other. But so I felt I'm saying that to say that I I could have contacted them and talked to them about a record. But I didn't want to uh I wasn't ready yet. I wasn't prepared to grab that from him yet. And I didn't want to utilize that until I knew that I what direction I was going in. So I didn't do it. I didn't I, I didn't reach out to him for it. And everybody was pressuring me about it. Like, yo, crack, you should get a lot of Neo about a record. At the time, it was like, yo, chill. Let me figure out how to, what's up with this album? Because that's when Jay, I felt Jay was dragging his feet with the album. So, well, yo, let me see what's going on with this album. Because I think we about to be the fuck out of here. Did you ever get a chance to meet 50 Cent? I had, I did meet 50 one day. Um, I was, uh, I was at MTV with Neo. We about to do TRL. Remember TRL? Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah, TRL, right. 106, Rap City. Right. So we about to do TRL live. So we in the MTV building in Manhattan. Uh, I got my son with me. And I, I, my cousin is Lala. You know Lala? Of course. So La got my son taking him all around the building. And while I'm getting dressed, I'm about to perform. And I, as I'm performing, I'm getting dressed. I left my door open because I just had to change my pants and put my boots on. So, and plus I wanted to see who was coming back and forth. So uh, I see 50 walk by. He like kind of just walks by the door kind of like this first. He just walks by and then he just dips back like, like, yo, you cool? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm cool. He was like, cool. And that was it. <laughs> That was it. But I knew he came to fuck with me because he knew we was about to perform. So I knew he came down just to make sure, you know, make sure that we, we acknowledge each other. That's what's up, man. Did you ever get a chance to work with any of the other guys from G-Unit? You must have worked with Mike Knox, right? Oh, yeah, definitely, man. I worked with Knox before he was on G-Unit. Shout yeah. out to Mike Knox, man. Uh, shout out to Knox. That was my boy. Me and Knox, man. My, Knox was a part of a group with me back in the day. A word? Yeah, Knox was in MOR with me. My man, Indy 500, Mike Knox, uh, Warbuck, and Don P. But that's a whole other story. But you were saying that um, was with Banks? Banks, yeah. Me and Banks were supposed to do some music together, man. Me and Banks is a real cool dude, man. Throughout the process of touring and just seeing each other in different cities and shit, uh, Banks always kept it real funky, man. We would always end up at these college shows, like us. Uh, always end up, it'll always be a state property G unit at a college somewhere together. And every time we was in the same building, uh, Banks would always make it his business to find me or let niggas know like, yo, Banks said, what up? He over here he said, come over and fuck with him. Or he'll just come walk in our back room and shit, yo, crack. So I got a lot, I respect niggas like that because I don't know Banks from the hood and nothing like that, but that showed me that he had respect for me, you know what I'm saying? Vice versa, you know what I'm saying? Could you tell me about the issues with Joel Santana? Where did they all start? Was it over him not acknowledging you? Um, all right, so look, I, I had already talked about this before, but I know I didn't talk about it on your shit, so I got you. I appreciate um, it. It ain't that, I think I was, I was tripping that night, honestly. I think I was tripping, I probably was a little saucy, drunk, you know what I mean? And uh, I definitely took a gesture the wrong way. I felt like he was trying to kind of like brush me off. But the only reason I felt like that was because of how our relationship was before that night. Like I felt, you know, we would talk on the phone a lot. Like, like yo, what up, bro? You cool? You coming down? You coming to uh, New York? I think we coming to Philly. And I mean, and we, we fuck with each other like that. So I was expecting a little more love than he was showing that night. And I think with the drink involved, I think I overreacted, honestly. You know what I'm saying? 
I think he gave me some shit. I'm like, I'm used to like, yo, Els, what up, baby? What's up, crack? And he just was like, like, yo, what up? And just kind of spun on me. Like, so I took that the wrong way. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Fuck. Yeah, you know, uh, Jewel's, Jim Jones, they were really reaching their height right then. You know what I mean? You, people could sort of feel a way about certain things like that, you know, when people are on their high horse and shit like that, you know. I think it might have just been thinking. Yeah, I think I was tripping because I was always was a good dude, man. To be honest with you, man. All of them dudes at, at Dipset was always really, really thorough, man. For real. I think it might be a Harlem thing or something because they was always real cool dudes, man. My right. Even Brit. Jim Jones, mad cool to me. Who? Even Jim Jones, mad cool to me when I met him in Miami. My nigga is Britt, Cam, Freaky, Jewels. Fucks with him. Well, I've actually done interviews with uh, Freaky Zeke. That was actually my first interview. Sen City, 40 Cal. Jim Jones, yeah. gave me, Jim Jones gave me a bit of an interview, but he was like, yo, Mikey, we don't do interviews. I'm like, you're going to do this interview. But nah, I was just, Jim Jones is a good-ass dude, man. I got a great, a great couple stories about him, man. But, but I want to ask you, you know, Petey, you were adamant. You, why were you so adamant about saying that this has nothing to do with with Jay-Z or Def Jam on that record? Um, why did I say that? Uh, Is it cause you oh, because you were part of the No, I said that because uh, it was already a, um, a, a little issue going on with Cam and, um, and Jay. Remember, you know, Cam and Jay always right. had these little, these little feud. So I just, I think at the time, I was just didn't want anybody to confuse that with me doing this uh, on some I'm with Jay and fuck y'all type of vibe. This ain't got nothing to do with that with the Jay-Z shit or none of that. This was a personal thing that I was wrong about. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I said that. Nah, PD, man. You're a big man to, you know, admit when you're wrong and shit like that, bro. I can respect hey, that. Come on, man. It's my That's my responsibility. You know what I mean? I apologize to him too. You know what I'm saying? Apologize to Els for that, man. Cause that, and plus, I, I really take my hat off to him because when I did get on, that, get on that bullshit, he didn't even say nothing crazy about me. People asked him about that in the interview one time, and I think he was just like, they're like, yo, what's up with PD Crack, man? Coming at you and shit. He's like, yo, man, I don't know what's up with Crack, man. He could have got disrespectful and said, like, yo, man, fuck Crack. But he ain't say shit. He just kept it regular. Like, I don't know what's up with him. I take my hat off to him for that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's maturity right there, man, on both of your ends. But, you know, I say that to say, like, because you two, like you said, it was always like, yo, hey, Els, what up? What was the situation when Dipsa actually linked up with Rockefeller? What do you remember most about it? I know uh, Diplomatic Immunity album came out right around the time of your album. Yo, I was loving it because, like I said, um, they were some cool-ass niggas, and – we just all clicked up real good. I mean, at least I know I did with them a lot. I don't know who wasn't feeling that they was there. I was loving it because I'm a major Cam Ryan fan, especially around that time. You know what I'm saying? We all grew up on, on Killer and the whole Harlem World uh, movement and all of that, Mace and all of that. So to be in the same building with them niggas, like, fucks with the dip set, man. So I was loving it. It was inspiring, like, yo, this is on. Like, we, we got uh, State Property in here, Rockefeller, Bleak, Cameron, Jewels, Jim, Baines, Freeway. It was like a big situation in one building. Like, we used to be up in uh, Baseline, heavy, like, deep. Like, and shit, Hits was coming out. Like, every room, uh, Hits was slamming out the room. Fucking uh, Just Blaze in one room. Going crazy. It was a, it was a major time. You know what I'm saying? That's what's up, man. So it really opened up a lot of doors for working with other artists. Uh, yeah. But to be honest, I wasn't really interested in that, man. You mean other artists outside of Rockefeller? I mean, like when you would go in the studio, you would see. You know what I mean? You'd see. Oh yeah. You know, you'd see Jewels in the studio. You'd see. You know what I mean? Forty Cal, maybe Hell Rel, any of these guys. Yo, check it. I, I did uh I did one for PD Crack first with uh Cam Ryan and Jewels up in baseline. So yeah, we came out with a lot of shit. 
I did ring the alarm in baseline. We said, man, I can't even name how many shit. He did what we do is wrong in baseline. Rock the mic. A bunch of shit. How does it feel to see Beanie Siegel and Oskino come back together, man, on his new podcast, Deeper Than Rap? Uh, that Yo, that was very, very interesting to see, man. Caught me off guard. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't even expecting this podcast. And to be honest with you, uh, I was I was I was looking at it a little funny at first when I first heard about Oskino having a podcast because I was like, "Yo, how O going to have a podcast? He ain't gonna let nobody talk." I was like, "Yo, O ain't gonna let you get a word in." So I was already looking looking at it like this when I when it came. I seen the first episode like, but to my surprise, he did a wonderful job and like the shit was like an official. Real podcast. It looked the look was great. He did a wonderful uh, job. Like his interviewing etiquette was dope. Uh, he wasn't. He was. He was asking a lot of bold, making some bold statements, and it, it was kept it entertaining. I was really proud of O for that, man. Like I was really, really proud. And then the freeway joint was dope too. So I'm like, yo, this nigga is two for two right now. Uh, he got is that. See, everybody can't do that. You know what I'm saying? But I, I'm surprised. O has it. He got the niche for that. I can't do that. I'm not a good. I can't talk that long and uh, asking questions. I can answer questions, but I. It's easy to answer questions because the person that's asking you, they the ones who got to think of the shit to ask you. I'm just counteracting. I'm a good counteractor. And big shout out to O. I'm waiting for him to call me. I, I'm going on. At first, I wasn't. I was like, Yo, I ain't going on that. I'm going. He called me. I'm fucking with it. Yeah, you'd have to imagine with, uh, you know, his public, his speaking skills. You wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call him public speaking skills, but he does do a lot of talking and it really has, it looks good on camera. I'm going to just say that much. It yeah. sounds good in his raps and it's coming off well on his podcast, man. And like you said, he has his whole set. You know what I mean? He's got it together. Yeah, man, I'm proud of him, man. I'm really proud. And especially... Honestly, especially after um, him going through the tragic situation with his son, um, yes, uh, he needed something like this to give him some more. You know what I'm saying? Some to make him feel a little better inside. I know this motivates him to see the response from people, and then oh, got a real beautiful side to him. You know what I'm saying? Right. And he's very honest and shit, and he could be a real big brother like to you, like. So I really like seeing him in this light. You know what I'm saying? So I hope you just keep it up. You know what I'm saying? As we saw on your promo runs with Oskino, you know what I mean? A lot of the times it was Oskino doing the rough, gritty, like, screw this guy, screw that guy. And then you were on your side just promoting what you were doing. I saw a number of interviews like that, man. So, you know, I take my hat off to Oskino for putting everything mm -hmm. behind him. Unfortunately. Definitely. Unfortunate that, you know, uh, his son passed and very unfortunate free son passed. But yeah. you know, Oskino is really using this light to, you know what I mean, guide him right now, man. I got to say, and it's impressive. I'm really proud of him, man. I, I say that with all my heart, man. I'm really proud of him, man. I, it, really, it really made me smile to see him doing good, man. Real shit. Yeah, and um, Oskino actually said something. I don't know if you – you must have caught it on the show, but sometimes shit can go over people's head. Oskino actually said on the show that he was going to try to do a mixtape with every member of the state property. Did you catch that? Uh, I didn't catch exactly that. I did hear them, like, referencing to, like, uh, doing some state property shit together, but I didn't catch the, the individual mixtape conversation. I didn't right. catch that. You better be ready for that shit, though, man. But but now, <laughs> in, in state property come together on an independent level, or does it need to involve Jay Z? Um, it needs to involve somebody with some money. A major somebody, difference. some somebody that's gonna bring the big M's up, because you know, without the money, man, there ain't nothing moving. You got to make niggas move. These are all the these are all like famous niggas that then did that have history in the game, and we all grown, and everybody's like a little a star in their own right. Nobody's moving. Just we need we need to see that this shit is serious, and we deserve it too. 
You know what I'm saying? Well, we tried that. We did that. Just uh, thugging it out. And we played them dudes already. You know what I'm saying? So just doing an independent thing and just seeing what kick back off this. No. Where, somebody, where the investors at? Somebody got to bring them 10, 10 M's up and do this shit right. You know what I mean? Because you get, you get what you put into it. So somebody got to put something into this to get, to get us up and at it. Because I'm only moving for the bread. Petey, man, I really appreciate you for joining me this interview tonight, man. It's a classic. Thank you, man. I appreciate you reaching out to me. Always watch this shit on YouTube, man. So that's love, Mikey. Thanks, man. Thanks.